got so you can pick it up over the web. So good afternoon, everyone. I don't know if you, you guys can't see the room, but we have everybody here from Wild County. No visitors today. Maybe they'll show up, or maybe everybody's on the web. But I'm Debbie Nasta. I'm the operations manager from Wild County Regional Communication Center, and we have all of our supervisors here and one of our GIS guys. Thank you for coming, Troy. So the way, um, this is our first class really because last time all we did was um, kind of run through the whole thing and tell you what it's going to be and how many classes to expect and what to expect and some of the resources and I see some of you and I don't know everybody on the web was able to buy your Bach yet. Let me just borrow yours since it's closed. So this is the Bach and um, the Book of Knowledge. So when you hear us say Bach, it's the Book of Knowledge from Nina, and it has <laughs> an outline and some resources, especially I was using it to prepare for today, and there's a lot that's not in there. So remember that. I'm going to keep on saying that because not everything in there is, is what you need to know. There's a lot more research to do. Also, Daryl was able to upload a draft of the presentation. It's missing some things, and I kind of did some cosmetic changes before we printed it and you guys have the update one in here. Um, it's to take notes and it's also you can also follow along because it's being displayed on the web by um, Daryl. So today we're covering sections C and D on um, 911 operations, telecommunications operations. So in your outline uh, it's on page 10 and that's the section we're going to cover C and D. So how this is going to happen for the other classes, we're looking for uh, subject matter experts. In fact, we're going to talk about it after our session today. We've already reached out to some people, some have committed. And so we don't know who's teaching what exactly yet. Hopefully we can post that on the webinar and you'll have an idea of which um, topic is coming up. So I'm the one teaching today and I chose this topic. So we're just going to go through it and ask questions if you can. And if not, I'm just going to go through the whole thing. So public safety answering point is the C section. And this is going to be acronym city. So I'm try I tried to set it up. And, you and you're going to have to know that every pre presenter is going to set it up differently. But I, I'm trying to focus on what the acronym means so that you can learn it. And one of the things I'm also going to prepare for you, but I'm not going to send them to you until right before our next session, is um, flashcards and a test before our next session so that you have time to study and learn these things, and then you'll receive the test, and you can test yourself to see how well you learned. And before we start next session, you um, take the test so that we can at least see if that's working for you or if we need to change anything. So public safety answering point, there it is, PSAP, PSAP, you always hear that, you work in one, most of you, right Troy? Okay, left click Debbie, left click. Types of PSAPs, primary, secondary, single jurisdiction, multiple jurisdiction, consolidated, co-located, and virtual. Um, any of those ring a bell to any of you? We're going to go through each one of them, but first let's look at the diagram that's on page 49, I believe, of, yeah, page 49 of your Bach. This diagram is far more than just a PSAP. If you guys want to turn since you have your books to page 49 or it's in your handout, this has a lot. And some of the pieces in it, you're going to learn as we go through some of the other sections, especially on how the 911 call is routed. That's what some of these pieces are. There's selective routing, there's a central office, 911 trunks, all that's not here in your PSAP. So really the PSAP itself is the little piece down here, the phone, the 911 call taker <coughs> position, the CAD, uh, the data radio network controllers. So it, PSAP is like right in here, that little section. But this is this flow of this diagram will make more sense as we finish and go through the study because we're going to cover how the call is routed. Any questions on that? So a primary answering point 
is the location where the 911 call is first answered. And I think we talked about this as an example last time. It's usually a law enforcement agency. Do you guys know why? Why is it a law enforcement agency? Because the majority of calls come are law enforcement related. So if they sent them to fire, what would fire be doing all day if it were a fire PSAP? It would be sending them, transferring them to law all the time. So typically, normally, primary PSAPs are law enforcement. Um, they could do law enforcement, fire, and EMS, but they, they have law. So in some major cities, there's a law enforcement PSAP and a fire PSAP. Secondary answering point. Uh, down here on the bottom, you see that sometimes it's referred to as S PSAP with a small S. Sometimes you see it with a big S. It's just secondary PSAP. And that means, since law was primary, fire and EMS are secondary. What was that? What's your question? I thought that a secondary PSAP was a different PSAP. Second question is, I, um, she thought that a secondary PSAP was a different PSAP, and it is. It's, and we're going to go through the rest of them, but it's physically located somewhere else. So in this center, for example, where we are, where we answer, we answer for law, I mean, we have law, we have fire and EMS, we handle it all. But in some bigger cities, they don't. And, and the, as Debbie said, the secondary PSAP is usually a fire or EMS PSAP. Um, but essentially what the, the secondary PSAP means is that that's the PSAP where 911 calls get transferred to. So a, a primary PSAP is one that answers 911 calls directly. If a PSAP only gets its 911 calls if they've been transferred from another PSAP, then they're a secondary PSAP. So, for instance, um, Arvada, Arvada Police answers all the 911 calls for the city of Arvada, but Arvada Fire has its own separate PSAP. So if it's a fire-related call, then Arvada Police will transfer the call to Arvada Fire. So Arvada Fire, in that case, is the secondary PSAP. And down in that neck of the woods also, there's some consolidated fire agency PSAPs. So all the separate law enforcement agencies may get the 911 call, and if it's fire, they're transferring it to West Metro Fire or South, Metro. South, South it's Medcom? Medcom. Medcom, because they they dispatch fire for many of those jurisdictions. So they are considered secondary. The primary 911 never comes to them first. Law answers first. They get a transfer. Single jurisdiction PSAP. Am I not moving here? I have to use the clicker. Um, it's a single organization such as a city, like the city of Loveland. City of Loveland is a single jurisdiction and they um, dispatch for their fire, law, and EMS. So, and they have boundaries of just that single jurisdiction. Does that make sense? Multiple jurisdictions. It's a county, and the PSAP answers, well, it could be a city or a county, but it answers 911 calls for two or more jurisdictions. An example would be us here, Well County Regional Communications. We answer calls for City of Greeley is one of our jurisdictions. City of Tacono is one of our jurisdictions. Any of our towns are our jurisdictions. And then there's all of our fire jurisdictions. So we are... Uh, multiple jurisdiction PSAP. And I meant to change those X's to the number of our municipalities. Can anybody tell me how many we have? 20. 20 municipalities? Well, 19 in the Nassau. Yeah. 19 in the Sheriff's Office makes 20 uh, municipalities. And uh, we provide fire law and EMS that cover the multiple jurisdictions. Next we have I think I just settled that. Multiple PSAPs are usually with, within one telephone exchange area. If one PSAP isn't able to take calls, 911 calls can be transferred to another nearby operational PSAP. For example, up until recently, till we moved into our new building, Loveland was our backup center. 
i think they're happy not to be our backup center anymore. they our volume is far too high. so now we back up to adams county and adams county backs up to us. if they have to switch their nine one one calls, they come to us and ideally you have inter um i can't even say that word intergovernmental agreements in place before you do this what's a consolidated piece up anybody without looking at your notes it's usually an agreement between two agencies so a city or county is designated as a piece up for several cities or counties and i actually asked asked robert to check this geography for me because washington and yuma are two separate counties in colorado but it's one PSAP that dispatches for both. So that's an example of a consolidated PSAP. Now why is this important? You're going to have to be able to differentiate <coughs> multiple jurisdiction versus consolidated PSAP on your test. Does anybody know what PSAP covers the largest geographic area in Colorado? Well, county. No. <laughs> no, you're close. Mm -hmm. Where? San Luis Valley. Oh. They have one piece up, covers six counties. Wow. So they, they are the they're the most consolidated uh, piece up in, in the state. Oh. Yes, State Patrol actually runs it. But they dispatch for all six counties and all the municipalities and volunteer fire departments within it. And this example on this slide is what Daryl just explained. Right? It's a consolidated piece that answers all 911 calls for two or more counties or each city within the two counties. Each of the cities have a police department, fire department, and maybe each county has their EMS system. To be able to operate in these environments, um, all of you in this room know this, um, standard operating procedures need to be in place on how to handle calls. Ideally, they're the same across all law enforcement agencies or fire agencies, and we know that doesn't happen. So my mantra to our agencies is if CAD can tell the dispatcher, we can do it. But if they have to remember, no, we can't. Because there's 40 agencies that you saw for us, 40 plus, there's too much to remember. Oh, this is XYZ fire department. What am I supposed to do here? The dispatch system has to be able to tell them. So computer-aided dispatch systems, as you all know, they assist in handling the calls and allow PSAP to handle multiple policies and procedures amongst different jurisdictions. That's, that's the tool that allows us to be able to dispatch for so many different entities and dispatch different units to each one. So the management structure of a consolidated PSAP varies largely across the nation. Um, historically, law enforcement has been under a police department or sheriff's office. Uh, fire agency might be under a fire department. And um, as we are here in Well County now, we are civilian. We are not under law or a fire. We, um, our director answers to the Board of County Commissioners and he is a civilian so it, it just depends sometimes when you have when you're under law enforcement and well just recently coming from Greeley police oversight your influence is heavily on the law side and when vice versa if you were if you're under a fire department your influence is heavily under the structure of the paramilitary organization in the fire department Civilian, it, to me, it feels really different. Uh, it's my first time all civilian, and I've been under fire departments. I've been under fire, too. I've <laughs> been under fire departments, under sheriff's office, and under police agency. And they're all, they all feel different depending on your management structure, and across the nation, you have every flavor. Are there private BSEPs? Do you guys know of one? Which one? What was that? Yeah. OnStar. Adams County? Not really, because it's publicly oversight. Yeah, they're, they're set up as a 501c3, mm -hmm. so they, they might be considered a private piece of it. It might, because it does make money. It's not a nonprofit. I think they are. That's I think they're set up as a nonprofit, but they're not a government agency. Yeah. Yeah. Medcom could be 
consider like Ad Adams County. But I think it's under, under just like we are, it's under <coughs> public domain, I guess, just lack of a different word. And um, OnStar is a good example because when the car, when they ring help from their vehicle, it's going to a private piece app that is, it's owned by, is it GM? Is it GM that owns OnStar? And OnStar, as a piece app, they have several major piece apps, a few in the United States and Canada. They are very active in our community of our APCO, NINA, and Navigator communities. In fact, Dispatcher of the Year was from OnStar at Navigator this year. So um, OnStar gets the call. They need to go by the geography or information they get from their systems to transfer it to the right piece app, and that's how we get them. Another example would be Entrado. They have a, a call center at Entrado. If there's ever a call, a 911 call in the U.S. that cannot be routed for some reason, they don't know what piece app to send it to, it goes to Entrado, and then they figure out where to send it to. So they, they have a private piece app for that purpose. And um, Entrado also handles the, it's not OnStar, that's proprietary GM, but the, the same type of system for Mercedes. They answer the calls for them. And for example, the, the Boston bomber guy, that stalled that Mercedes, they were able to activate the tracking system and they were on the phone with law enforcement in Boston telling them where they where the vehicle was going. They were on the phone for a couple hours tracking that vehicle. I guess the guy stole the wrong car. <laughs> Why is OnStar not considered a secondary piece out if they Be answer the call and route it somewhere else? Because they're not the same as OnStar. Because they're getting it first. And, and the person isn't dialing 911, it's being activated by their system. Information, and they're actually doing that might be another example. You know, and that, that's, that's something about this definition that's kind of changing right now because neither OnStar nor those medical alert companies are receiving 911 calls. Nobody dialed 911 to get to them, but it is a first call for help. So as we start moving away from thinking of just 911 calls as being what we do and more thinking about emergency calls for help is what we do, then those are those are more and more like a, a, an actual definition of a piece app. Yeah, on Star they do EM, they do EMD and everything else. Yeah. And the comment was that some of the medical alarm companies are doing EMD also. Virtual piece app. A virtual piece app is portable and scalable. It can be as little as one laptop. It can many laptops that you end up building a full-fledged 14 workstation dispatch center. It allows employees to do everything they do here at the comm center itself. You know you can't do it in your jammies at home. Uh, <laughs> it's, been, it's beneficial for contingency planning, so should you have to abandon the building? Or uh, when Daryl and I were talking <clears throat> before the session about um, Larimer County, and as many of you know, during the floods, Estes Park, they were completely sh disconnected from the world for a, a long time. They have now developed their systems and networks to where any one of those PSAPs in Larimer County will be able to answer the phones from the other one. If Estes or any of them ever get cut off again, um, they can move employees into Loveland, into Fort Collins or Larimer County and answer calls that would normally be going, be answered in, in Estes Park. Um, so they, they got that problem and they've solved it. And it eliminates the need for large amounts of workspace that may go unutilized. And for example, we're setting up our backup center. It's a different geographic location that's going to have 14 workstations, but it's a backup. If we never have to leave, if we never have to get, you know, our systems don't go down here, when will we use it? So that's where virtual comes in, where you don't have to have that dedicated space. But um, we're going to be using ours, we heard, right? So our backup is considered a virtual PSAP? No, it's, in, instead of, the question was, is our backup center considered a virtual PSAP? No, it isn't. It eliminates the need to dedicate that space and all that equipment to just be sitting there for occasional use. 
if you had it all on laptops or ability to set it up you know make a phone call to all your dispatchers and they can get on at home and they can start answering calls that's you know that's the future it's coming do we have any examples of that was my question there I left a, I left a blank line because I do know and when, when Next Generation 911 was first talked about 10, I don't want to say 10 years ago, there's one state, and somebody, if anybody on the web knows, there's one state that way back then, they did Next Generation IP-based phones from the ground up in this entire state, because it's a small state. They were able to do that, and I remember the presentation where they could grab a laptop and go answer calls anywhere. Vermont, maybe. I, We're going to have to look that up. I believe it was Connecticut, because uh, they have a single fiber ring that, of course, it's a small state. But they have more PSAPs than Colorado does, even though they're so small. And they have a single fiber ring that connects them all into a single, and they have a single uh, phone system for all the PSAPs. Another way to think about cloud, or excuse me, virtual PSAPs is um, if you think of putting all of the equipment in the cloud if you know what that means, basically putting it all on a computer network that can be accessed from multiple locations. So like Debbie was describing, you can have um, you can have the ability to move operations very easily if you can access uh, the same equipment from, from different locations, but it also allows multiple locations to act as if it were a single PSAP. And uh, you know, I know we have some people on uh, on the web today from uh, from Larimer County, but that's that's one of the things that they've been working on. They have a single phone system now that connects all five of, the, the, of their PSAPs. If they connect all their other equipment, I don't know where they're at on on getting a common CAD system and RMS system and things like that. But if they connected all their other equipment so that you could access any of the systems from any of the PSAPs, then it would be a true virtual PSAP environment. So we, we probably will we'll look into which state. And and there's probably several, maybe larger cities that have gone next gen that have this ability. I mean, it's just moving forward. Next, we're going to talk about PSAP 911 equipment. And it becomes acronym world. So these are all the ones we're going to talk about, and I won't repeat them right now because we're going to go through each one of them, but not exactly in that order. That order <coughs> on this slide is exactly how it is in the outline, but as I, as I was putting it together, I was referring to stuff that we hadn't talked about yet, so I kind of switched it up. So we're going to start with CPE. Anybody know what that is? It's on the next slide. <laughs> Customer premise equipment, and you'll hear our vendors refer to our equipment as CPE. That's all you will hear. They won't tell you it's the workstations. They won't tell you it's the phone system. They, they'll just say you're CPE, and you're supposed to know what it is. Have you, you've probably heard that before, right? How about Annie? And it looks like I ended up getting lazier and just saying, here it is, and this is what it means. But it's automatic number information. It's a telephone number associated with the access line from which the call originates. It's the number of the person that's calling you. And as you know, in the wireless world, which there is a whole section on wireless, it means something different. So P.S. Annie. P.S. is for pseudo. There isn't another name for that, right? It's just pseudo. Annie, but um, sometimes you'll see it as um, the little p, and then the outline has it as capital P-S, Annie. Um, I've seen it a lot like this, lowercase <coughs> p, Annie, and Annie was a, yeah, we're learning. So it's a telephone number used to support routing a wireless call, but it can also, you know, gives you a cell sector or piece up to which the call should be routed. It's also known as the routing number, but a pseudo Annie, in a, or is it the pseudo alley, gives you the location in a big complex, like um, say this complex here. We have so many buildings, and we have one PBX main number. 
when you dial 911, does it say it's 1551 North 17th Avenue? So that's what the pseudos are for. There's another database that somebody has to maintain. Does it usually maintain the PBX operator or the PBX owner? Uh, Entrato has software that the large organizations like the hospital, like IBM, you know, big complexes like that, or school districts, that they actually maintain it and support it. So the example I use for Well County are PBX phone people should be entering the data to that database. Do they? Not always. So are you saying that a PBX line is a pseudo? Yeah. The def defined location, like um, cubicle three on floor 13 is the pseudo. Uh, you those of you who take calls, you know when you receive a, a cell call, you actually have two different phone numbers on there. One of those phone numbers you can call back and the other one you can't. You can't. Yeah. The one you can't is the pseudo ante. The whole purpose of that number is just to create a record that's used for routing the call to the correct call center. So that's the pseudo ante. Uh, it's just a, it's basically a fake shell record that's used for the purposes of routing. And we're going to talk about pseudo alley. Is that the location one then that the database has to maintain, be maintained? Is that, that number the same across the board, or is it just auto-generated as a fake record? Is the records created so that the names that goes up? So the question is if that pseudo number is generated, or is it the same across the board? It's, it's different for every cell tower sector. So every cell tower sector has a fake, basically a sh it's called a shell record that's created for it. And when, you, when it receives the call, it, it basically puts the additional information, which is the, um, you know, the real callback number, in the additional information field. But the ante that shows up on the call taker screen is that, that fake shell pseudo ante that is associated with that cell sector. So it's like Well, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the phone number that's assigned to the tower so that when, it re when it's received by the selective router database, and you'll get more into this later, it has a record to attach onto to figure out where to send that call. Okay. Now, when we show you all the routing of a call, some of these numbers and things will make sense. So today you're getting the acronyms so that when we do the routing, they'll be able to say, whoever's presenting, we'll say the ANI, the ALI, the pseudo ALI, and you'll know what it is. So ANI displays was in the outline, and it really just is where you display the telephone number associated with the call. So it's your terminal screen. I have a question on that, PS ANI. Uh, you know, if it's a phase one cell phone, then is the location The question is if it's a phase one cell phone, is that number associated with the location of the tower? Yeah, because you said that that secondary number is the tower phone number essentially. Right. So if it's phase one, is that where we're getting our location? Well, phase one or phase two, the phone number that's in the ANI field is the pseudo ANI. And you get an address in, in the alley field that is associated to that cell tower. But that's not necessarily where the caller is. It's probably not where the, the caller is. You have to, if it's phase two, then you get the X and Y on the second screen. And how it displays is different depending on what kind of phone phone equipment you have in your piece out. Next up is any controller, and it's just a component of the CPE, which is customer premise equipment. So it's just a piece of our customer premise equipment, which provides the decoding. It's just a function that controls a 911 service. But it's something to know. It's going to be on your flashcards because this question, this answer, although it's simple, will be embedded with something that looks like that, and you got to pick the right one. So that, that's the stuff you got to start thinking about. <coughs> Allie. So if N was number, Al is location. So it displays in the PSAP the caller's um, address, the caller's address location, of, and um, the supplementary emergency service information of the location from which the call originates. Is that the English language translations that they're referring to there? Maybe? Where it gives you the jurisdiction kind of attached to it, 
Right. Yeah. Right. English language translation. So I don't recall in the outline of English language translations comes up or if it's a question on the test, but it could be. However, across the nation, it's either here in Colorado, it's ELTs in California, they were telltales. So I, maybe that's why it's not on the test, because pe different people in different areas call it different things. But it's something to know. So English language translations and you hear your phone company, people just call them and refer to them as ELTs. So you get the location of the caller, and it tells you which law, which fire, which EMS. Those are your English language translations of a number, and you'll find out about that number later. As in Annie displays, it's just where the alley displays. And here's the PSLE, and I was probably confusing PSLE with PS Annie, so sorry for confusing you. But it is um, alley record that is associated with the with the pseudo Annie, and so it's a location, and that's where I was saying it's the third floor, cubicle 13, or maybe I said it backwards. I said cubicle three on the 13th floor, or um, in the large complex. If you're all governed by the same PBX number, which ours is what three, four, six, four thousand. Where is extension 2222? They all have different addresses, right? So. Um, if somebody dials 911 from one of our desk phones, does it tell you where to go? I think the county phone system So, and that's because somebody's entering that information in a lower database of where exactly where to go. Alley controller is again on a piece of your CP equipment, your customer premise equipment. And system controller, it's just, there, there's your definition, an entity providing one or more of the following 901 elements, whether it's network, CPE, or database service. So this is a lot of memorization, really, and maybe the reason we are trying to explain it so you can get a feeling for it is so that it's explained versus just memorized and you kind of know what it is. Anybody know what ACD is? Automatic call distribu distributor, what we don't have anymore, <laughs> which they wish they did. <laughs> a large PSAPs have this, um, where it's, there's a system in the back that's taking care of how many calls each operator is answering, who gets the next call, and there's le different levels of who should be answering a call, because maybe you want your law enforcement radio operator not to answer a call, so they'll never get one. And so that's what an ACD is. Many of you might have it, some of you maybe have never seen one. If you're curious about it, and if you've never seen one, maybe visit a PSAP that does have one in place. Denver, Denver would be one. I'm curious as to why you miss yours. Well, County misses their ACD. Because it only rings at one console and it gives every call taker the equal amount of calls. And the two channels we don't want to have taken nice ones don't have to. I was a manager of a PSAP in another state in my last job and I was going to get an ACD for the uh, comp center and my employees practically threatened to um, leave. <laughs> what's, what's, what's the word? Uh, we revolt, mutiny, that's the word I'm looking for. We didn't like the thought of it when they told us we were going to it after we had it, we loved it. After you had it, you liked it. Yeah, yeah. so that's initially they didn't like the thought, but once they had it, they loved it. Yeah. And um, the move to the new center with our new CPE, we decided not to install it so that the phone would be answered and not have a pre recorded voice telling them, hey, this is Joe. They missed their pre recorded voice too. <laughs> Anyway, here's our next acronym, CTI, and it means Computer Telephony Integration. And it's integrating a telephone function into a computing device. And I don't know if that makes sense to anybody, it's just something to learn. It is on the list. I have 
Telephony. 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 And it's basically CTI is why you can answer your, your phone by touching a, touching a screen instead of picking up a handset. It just it, it's incorporating the telephone function into you, into a computer system. Telephony. Okay, gateways had a long definition. Now some of these definitions, um, there is a glossary in the um, Nina website that I encourage you go to, to go look at. It had the danger there is kind of stick to your outline and the stuff that they're telling you to study because that glossary has a lot of stuff. So don't think you need to learn every single every single thing on that glossary. I would stick to your outline because that's where the test is coming from. But that's where some of these definitions come from, and I'll just read it to you. The point at which a circuit switch call is encoded and repackaged into IP packets. Is that French already? Yes. Equipment that provides interconnection between two networks with different communication protocols. Two examples are packet assembler and disassemblers and protocol converters. So I would encourage you just to... If you want to know more about this, kind of holler at us. And those of you on the net, on the web, just if you want us to describe this more so that it makes sense to you, let us know. Because I, I, I think sometimes people learn if you know what, what the gateway actually does. And we can get into it more if you want to. Otherwise, here's your definition. Well, this will be covered more in the next generation 911 section, too. This will be covered more in the next generation 911 section, too. Other piece of equi equipment on the outline are in this list right here. And um, I couldn't find why dispatch was listed as other piece of equipment. <laughs> Do you know, Daryl? So it's the act of sending units from <laughs> required, not requires, required disciplines, law, fire, EMS, to the reporting party needing services. I, I don't know why else. Yeah, that's there. not really a uh, system, so yeah. I don't know. So, Recording is hardware software systems that record the voice, so it integrates to your telephony, and radio transmissions for subsequent retrieval. So there's all kinds of recording systems. One reason they might have had dispatch on there separately is, is honestly, I don't think there are any in Colorado, but there are some PSAPs in the country that don't dispatch at all. All they do is take 911 calls and then transfer them to another agency for dispatch. Um, so in those cases, you know, you, the idea of separating 911 from dispatch makes sense because they're they're two separate functions. They're actually handled by different agencies. And the comment in the room is that OnStar is an example of that. CAD system we described it briefly. It's a computer-based system which aids PSAPs telecommunicators and automating selected dispatching and record keeping activities. Records management system, it's also a computer based system which contains selected dispatch information because it, uh, usually a dispatch uh, record initiates your RMS record. Not always, some uh, depends on how the jurisdiction uses it, they uh, might create a record without a dispatch record because they, they use it for different reasons. I guess an example would be if you have property but there was no dispatch record that went with it, but you're putting property into records management and you create a record that doesn't have an associated CAD. So that records management, it, it keeps a lot more information. Mobile data systems. Here is the definition in the NEMA glossary. It's in the context of location information to support IP-based emergency services. A user is said to be mobile if they're able to change access points while preserving all existing sessions. So if they're on CAD and they're moving and they're not losing their CAD session. Um, they're known as mobile data terminals. They're also known as status heads. Has any, any of you heard that? MDT, status heads was the original, MDTs followed and they were just buttons where they would press the status, like en route, on scene, clear. Um, they could type very little into them because they were just, it's the older versions. And then it's all evolved into now they're complete laptops. And 
um, they call them MDCs now, mobile data computers. ABL, automatic vehicle location, um, the sergeant in the trunk, right? Have you guys heard that? It's the sergeant in the trunk and law enforcement has historically been against this because they don't want the sergeant to know they're sitting at Starbucks for two hours. Or you didn't know they're sitting at Starbucks two hours because you might order something. So uh, FIRE has, was our early adapter of ABL before law enforcement, but I think law enforcement across the nation has really embraced it since. And FIRE liked it because you, uh, they adopted the closest unit in ABL, their location helped to determine who was the closest unit to the incident. Here's another acronym, TDD, TTY. And I put them both up there, telecommunications device for the deaf and teletypewriter. That's what TTY is. It's a device capable of information interchange between compatible units using a dial-up or private line telephone. But our deaf community today, what, and those with hard of speech, what are they using? Video relay. Video relay. Texting. They're not liking these devices anymore because what well, they got to pay a line. They have a device when they could use their phone. I was going to grab my phone, but it has the clock there. <laughs> they could use their phone and they want to. And so text to 911 is something they're looking forward to. So they can abandon these devices. And we have some of them already saying, that's so old, I don't, even, I don't even have one in my house. I need to be able to talk to you via text or tapping or something. So that community is going to push us to adopt it. And we're working on it. Uh, time synchronization, it's also known as a net clock. Have you heard that term? It's some hardware in the back room somewhere that John takes care of that will um, synchronize CAD recording and radio. And is that important? Some of you that when you look up a call and you go into your recorder and it's off by a minute and a half. So that's important to keep them all synchronized. Mapping systems, you see there's something for you, Troy. <laughs> GIS is normally what we refer to it as geographic information systems and um, they're integrated into our telephony so you have we have a map with our Viper not everybody has maps with their phone systems um, early adoption of when CADS did not have maps the phone companies went out right away and said hey here's a map and I can tell you where the caller is so some of the maps came in through some of the 911 systems before CAD systems put them in. But now you have it with CAD, you have it, you can have it with, we have both here in Welland County and they just tell you different stories. You know, the map can tell you exactly where the caller is on the, on the phone system and on the CAD, we can have a whole slew of other information like jurisdictional data, common places, icons. We can have the same in both. We just keep Troy busy. <coughs> Radio communications, I didn't really look further into it to see if we dig into this anymore other than this list for radio. Because radio is something Nina doesn't really, I guess, dive into. That's not their thing. But you should know it because it's part of our PSAP. So, trunked radio. All users use the same radio frequencies. Channels are dedicated to a department. Talk groups are assigned to separate conversations. Interoperability between various agencies is possible because of their sharing of the talk groups. And not all users need to access the system at the same time. So these features will be listed as what is a trunked radio system. And what they'll do on the test is make them all look like they're all good answers. So uh, understand and learn. And if I think I wrote the page number in the handout, did I? No. I think it's page 21 is where all the radio stuff, there's, there's some larger paragraphs, more than the bullets I put up there, that um, we'd be happy. If, again, if you have further questions about radio to better understand it, let us know or reach out to your radio person in your piece up and they can help you and you know we can go into it more if you guys want to VHF UHF I do remember that these frequencies are something you need to know 
it's gonna it's gonna ask you what is a VHF frequency, what is a UHF frequency. Are we a trunked radio system? We are a trunked radio system. And that would be the same with if you're on DTRS, or in the case of Adams County and Well County, we're on the um, Frick system. They're both trunked radios, 800, and Frick is 7, 800. I believe DTRS too, is too, but I... So UHF, ultra high frequency. So that'll be four, five, seven, eight, and 900 megahertz frequencies. So the highlights of uh, UHF is that these ranges tend not to carry as far as the lower frequencies, and they do penetrate structures better. You may not be able to communicate large, more than 25 miles away without having some little help with the system, and we'll talk about repeaters here soon. But uh, portal, portable radios allow communications inside buildings. Get the car in. Well, I guess in some cases you do. VHF, very high frequency, there's uh, two bands. There's a low band and a high band in VHF, and you should know those frequencies. You know, 32, 39 to 72 for low band and 145 to 159 for high band. And channels in these frequencies tend to travel at greater distances than those that are higher frequencies and work well in inner city, which is why in the mountains you'll see them using uh, VHF because um, they, they are not, it will, it, I think it's more the greater distances than anything else. And um, VH, VHF just will go farther than your 800, 700 megahertz frequencies. And if, especially if there's ridges and stuff, the ridge will stop that frequency from moving forward. I'm not sure if VHF jumps and goes next. I'm not sure. I'm not really. We can, uh, if you really want to know more radio, we can we can delve into this. Mobiles and portables, they're like remote computers. And they're in continual contact with the base station of your radio system. The antenna site with the strongest signal takes control of that radio. So. Those of us on a 7800 system, when you hear bonks in dispatch, it's because that base station is overloaded. There's too many people hitting it, and they're not able to take control and trans retransmit the, the information. And the system authenticates if the radio belongs on that system or not. So now that this year we separate it from the digital trunks radio system from the state, the Well County and Adams County radio IDs are not on DTRS, and the DTRS radio IDs are not on Frick. So that there are certain talk groups for mutual aid are granted, and so those radios are only authorized to use those talk groups. And if they come across, they're authenticated with yes, you can use this North Mint channel, and yes, I'm going to let you go through. And these things that or on this slide really only apply to trunked radio systems. The old-fashioned analog radio systems uh, that are still in use in a lot of parts of the country don't have those features where it can check IDs and, and um, you know, determine who has authorization to be on the system and who doesn't. Basically, if you have access to that frequency, you can talk. And there's a description of what Daryl just said in your box. Um, for the because he's right, there's areas in the nation where they don't have these newer systems. You may have been using it for a long time, but it doesn't mean others have been able to transfer it to it. These are very expensive systems. Repeater systems is just a method of allowing a radio system to provide greater coverage. You remember one of the previous slides said 25 miles was kind of like the max. But if you put repeater stations on towers or different locations, it continues that transmission so that you can come from farther distances than 25 miles. So these little nuggets, and like I said in your book, there's a very good description, um, are things that are, are going to be, the question might be, what is true about a repeater system? And then they might put, you know, five different descriptions and you gotta pick the right one. 
So understanding it's important. So if we are confusing you with some of this, make sure you holler at me and let me know. Satellite is just another way of uh, getting a greater signal reception. And signals are sent to a microwave or landline to a central controller. There's a central controller that votes or selects the best audio signal coming from the satellite receiver. But then again, there's older systems that can't use this. So just make sure you take, take a look at that section that's talking about the older radio systems. And radio over IP, it's just using technology to transmit radio over a network. You'll see this in emergency operation centers. You know, you have a frequency that they might put into, um, into the network that you might be able to hear either on your computer or a dedicated phone. And there might be like law enforcement instead of having their portable to the air like that while they're in a noisy EOC, they might have a, a headset to a radio or to their laptop and they're listening to it over the network. So there's just different ways of hooking up the radio information. Oops. I'm going backwards. What happened here? Okay, now we're switching to section D. Any, any questions on C? Move forward. We should just go to section D so that we can finish our time here. Do you know what the difference between a simplex and a duplex radio system is? Simplex uses, go ahead. Oh, it's just more like a, what time you have it's Yeah, well, it can have a repeater, actually, but a simplex radio, uh, simplex radio channel will have one frequency that it's using, which means that only one of you can talk at a time, because you'll be talking on the same frequency. Duplex will be set up, or full duplex will be set up, where it has, it's actually using two frequencies, one for talking and one for listening. Uh, and so when, it's, when you're listening, you're actually listening to a, sep a different frequency. But that allows both of you to talk at the same time. And, and that is described very well in the box, the talk in versus sending out. And you hear sometimes when we say, well, why didn't they go on to a simplex channel? The one he just described, because we have simplex channels in our system. And sometimes it is within close proximity, because it could have a repeater, but many times they don't. So we have uh, fire agencies might switch over to a simplex because they're, they can see you, but they can't holler at you, so they're going to talk on the radio on the simplex channel. So is that like their city channel? Like Evans has a city channel. So Evans has a city channel, but it might be a duplex frequency. I'm not sure. It is. It is. Simplex does not tie up the radio system. It's like a helicopter line of sight, you know, ground. Helicopter might use it too from, from, for landing. So in your case, what, what you're probably talking about is you have these other frequencies that can be used. Um, agency I was in before, they call them talk around channels. Yeah. Where they can talk to each other, but it's not, it's not tied into your trunk radio yes. system. Mm -hmm. um, and they also happen to be simplex channels, so that's what you call them. So we have like six more minutes, so I'm going to kind of breeze through the next section, which is um, section D in your outline. And it's PBX, PSP. This will be, this is more for acronym alphabet soup so that you can start getting these acronyms in your head so that when we do our presentation on PBX versus and wireless and how the call gets routed and all that, you have some of this of what it means. And this is a list under D. It's just color, location, identification, private switch, and the alley information, transport, and routing. So what does PBX mean? Public Brands Exchange. It's a telephone system. MLTS. It wasn't on the list, but it ended up on my slides, and don't ask me why. I don't think my brain knew that, but it's there. It's good to know. Multi-line telephone system. And when we do our presentation, we might talk about MLTS. So that's why you're getting these acronyms, so that you can uh, know what we're talking about without having to go in and explain them. Private switch, <coughs> any alley. 
Um, this was also a definition from the glossary, and this is how it was set up there. It said PS-911. It's also, you might see it like that. That was directly from the glossary, so we'll have to put that in your in your cards. Do you have a question? Someone? Where does VoIP phones fall into this? Where do VoIP phones fall into this? So VoIP, it's not on the list, but it may, doesn't mean it's not further down in the outline, I haven't checked. Isn't, I think it is. Well, VoIP can be a couple of different things, but you can have an MLTS, multi-light telephone system, that is a VoIP, a VoIP network. Yeah. Um, but VoIP can also be directly to someone's home that's not on a multi-line telephone system. So VoIP is just another way of delivering phone calls. You can deliver them analog over a traditional line line, or you can, de you can deliver them as an IP network. And if it's delivered as an IP network, that's what VoIP is, voice over internet protocol. But businesses do use VoIP, correct? Businesses a lot of times use VoIP, mm -hmm. but a lot of the, there are still the old fashioned PBX systems out there, mm -hmm. which are analog uh, switchboard systems. And sometimes those are still in use. Isn't there some laws about this one here, the private switch any Elliot, where some Looking at businesses or companies having to provide that information. There, it, it's a um, the question. It's a proposed legislation at the federal level right now to provide incentives. Some states have requirements. Colorado does not. And we'll get more into the the regulation and legislation part of it. And there's there's actually a whole uh, session on that later on in this series. <coughs> so this private switch. Telephone system, which includes network switching database elements capable of providing a nanny and an alley, designed to use in emergency situations to notify public safety. I think an example of this, when we were at Navigator at Disney World, is um, the hotels might want their 911 call to go to their security before it goes to the local BSAP. And hotels is one of the things that will be talked about in the legislation. Information transport, it's just where the media is transferred. What are the types, oh, this is supposed to be media right here. Types of media include copper, fiber, microwaves, satellite, and coaxial. And on page 29 to 31, it describes every single one of those. And you should know the differences. I just thought it was a little too boring, and I saw I had too many slides already <laughs> to describe every single one, but I will include it in the test, and I will include it in the in the flashcards. Does everybody want flashcards? Yeah. And those of you on the webinar, just send me an email. I mean, we're going to post it all, so you can download whatever you wish to use. Routing, definition from the glossary. An interface device between two networks that selects the best route to complete the call, even if there are several networks between the originating network and the destination. Um, this routing definition should be something you understand, so make sure you read it. And uh, routing is what we will go into in depth when we show you how a 911 call travels. You've seen some of this because I teach it at Academy, but. Um, we're trying to get someone that knows this because this is what she does every day and one of the things that she'll do is she'll probably be drawing it on the whiteboard and uh, show you how the call traverses everything we can get her if not I guess I'll be drawing <laughs> so, um, so any questions and okay it's 159 with 43 seconds <laughs> any questions any questions on the web uh, we had one one correction, uh, Ed Roth, uh, and I just looked it up in the, the Nina glossary to make sure PBX stands for private branch exchange rather private, than public. Private, not public. Okay. So you think of it, it's usually used in, in a private company or a hotel or something like that. So PBX is private branch exchange. Good. I will change that. And, um, and then for those of you on the web, the first set of... Um, documents that was uh, it was missing one of the printouts and some cosmetic changes so I'll make those changes that I just noticed in the one you just gave us and uh, Daryl will repost it so that you have it you can transfer your lovely notes um, so what are we doing next so like I said I'm going to send you 
not before you study, because then you'll know what you have to study, but probably, let's say Tuesday, uh, the week before our next class. So the next class is June 12th. On the 10th, we'll post a test and be true to yourself. Don't look at your notes and take the test. It's just to test yourself. You're, I mean, you're not accountable to anybody but yourself. It's just helping you to see if you took this time to kind of memorize some of this stuff. I'll get the flashcards up there, um, let's say by Monday and this coming Monday, so you can use them to study. And I'll get the test up, so when we come back, we won't be going over the test unless you have a dire question. It's just for you to touch base and see how you're learning, because guess what? You're gonna delve into a whole new set of acronyms and a whole different list of items to learn, so you gotta be learning these as we go. I have June 11th. Is that a Thursday? That's a Wednesday. Um, Why were we doing Wednesday? Well, I think because I was leaving for Nina. But oh, okay. You, you, me, and Monica will work it out, and we'll send out an email yes. to everyone. No one will be. And we'll let you know the topic because that's what we're going to discuss next. Is uh, who we're signing up for when. We did get some people step up to help, and anybody that's listening, if you still want to teach a subject, holler at us. And uh, if there's nothing else. We're going to say goodbye and we'll see you next time and go study.